Welcome to episode 216 of Wealth Talk. My name is Christian Rodwell, the Membership Director for Wealth Builders, joined today by our founder, Mr. Kevin Whelan. Hello, Kevin. Hi, Chris. Good to be with you again today. It's been an interesting week, hasn't it? Yeah, well, we took a trip up north, didn't we? And uh, we had a fantastic event up in Manchester, where we met many of our existing members and also some people who have been listening uh, to the podcast. They haven't yet dipped their toe in the water, but it was really, really good to meet everyone face to face last week. Mm, you had a bit of a nosebleed going up north, didn't you? No, nah, <laughs> not quite. It was fine getting up there. We had a big delay on the way back, though, didn't we? We did. We did. Unfortunately, we had a three-hour delay on the uh, way on the train on the way back, and uh, that's always a bit disappointing. But we got through a lot of conversations, you and I, and a lot of work as well. So very useful and a good podcast, by the way. Again today, I thought uh, very useful. A lot of people were asking questions in Manchester about families and how to be a great money role model so you pulled out some really good lessons from our guest today yes our guest today is Susie Carter she's no stranger to wealth talk or to the wealth builds community and Susie's been a property investor specifically commercial property for uh, over 30 years now so very very experienced and respected and she's the founder of the commercial property academy and um this week was focusing more on Susie's family and uh, how she's been introducing the concept of money and finances to her two children, who are Felix and Digby, and of course her husband involved in that process as well. So we're going to dive into some of those questions today and uh, yeah, it was insightful. Always insightful, but she obviously gave a little bit of an insight at the start of the interview you had with her too, Chris, which was really about this, this concept of wherever there are challenges, there are always opportunities if you can focus on the niche that you're in so uh she's mentioned there's been quite a dramatic kind of change i suppose an evolution in many respects of the commercial property market and um no shortage of opportunities despite the fact you know the sort of macroeconomic picture remains somewhat uncertain but uncertainty always brings opportunity and we constantly hear our uh our, our focused uh, wealth building experts say the very same thing and no surprise to hear it from uh, from Susie as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, the importance of focusing on niche and strategy, regardless of what asset class you're focusing on, because we know that there's so much out there, so much choice, and that can lead to overwhelm. We've seen that inside our academy with our own members, and hence why we are there to provide a clear roadmap so people can follow step by step with support as well from coaches and from peers. Mm. Exactly right, because it's very easy to get caught up, particularly in uncertainty, to sit on your hands and do nothing. But it's the very opportunity that is presented by uncertainty that I think uh, is worthwhile, even if it's to diversify into something else. Because the importance in the long term perspective of wealth building is to work out ways to deal with risk. And while there's uncertainty, there are just different risks. So if you can de risk, diversify, you get yourself in a much stronger position. So sometimes it's important to have more than one strategy or more than one niche. So you might be a niche in property, a niche in investing, a niche in business and so on, uh, and try and create and spend some time in some of those opportunities when other things close down a little for you. Yeah, and just again, around the importance of having connections and community, I'll just quickly mention the next event that we've got coming up, which is in London on the 14th of November. And that's going to be a networking and cash flow 101 evening. So the opportunity to come and play Robert Kiyosaki's uh, cash flow 101 game, which is a board game, really fun, learning the rules of money. But if you don't fancy playing the game, come along anyway, because there'll be an opportunity. Hopefully you'll be there as well, Kevin, to uh, just have a drink and chat with other like-minded Wealth Builder members. Well, you mentioned the word drink, so I'm bound to be there. <laughs> Glass of red will be available, I'm sure. So, uh, all right. Well, if you're interested in coming along to that event, head to the Wealth Builders website, wealthbuilders.co.uk forward slash events. All right. I think it's time for us to head on over now to our conversation with Susie Carter. Susie, welcome back to Wealth Talk today. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you, Christian. Nice to see you again. I know. And uh, I was looking back last time we spoke on the podcast, I think was, you know, just after COVID times and we were looking at the market, which I guess was in turmoil back then, really, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it definitely was. And I think we were all kind of wondering what the heck was happening. But actually, the commercial market took a bit of a 
a bit of a climb after that and uh, and really improved. So, yeah, really interesting kind of where that one ended up. Yeah, well, you know, you're obviously the founder of the Commercial Property Academy, many, many years of experience behind you, which, you know, we talked about that on the previous podcast. But um, what opportunities are you currently seeing in the, in the property market right now, Susie? Yeah, well, obviously, as you say, I'm a commercial property expert. I've been in that market for almost 30 years now, which is a bit scary. Um, I mean, this will be my kind of third proper cycle that I've seen. And I'm definitely seeing all the signs of previous cycles, you know, previous downturns in cycles in the commercial market. Um, Obviously, I'm talking about commercial here, not residential. Um, You can see that lending is really starting to um, seize up which is really affecting the commercial market. It's really affecting pricing. Um, Interest rates going up has obviously got a big part to play in that. Um, And so, you know, on one hand, you can look at that as as a negative, but I mean, all I'm seeing is opportunity really, is that um, as long as you're in cash uh, at the moment, so, or or got certain strategies where you can get commercial finance, and you know you you understand what your niche is and what your strategy is in commercial. Um, and I think over the I don't know how long it's going to last for, but over the, say the next six to eighteen to twenty four months, there could be some fantastic opportunities in the market, and we're already seeing that happening right now. Um, we just we just bought a, a business out of administration actually, and um, you know it's a significant discount. So we're definitely seeing more administrations in the market. Um, again, you know, if you've got money to invest and, and you're, you're active in this market, there's, there's some good opportunities. Mm. No, thank you for the update there. And I'm sure, you know, your members will, you know, be changing tax as the market changes. And of course, with your support uh, behind them, be, uh, be able to get those successes. So um, today we're talking around the topic of families, Susie. You've been in business yourself, you say, there for, you know, 30 years and, and you came back from a, well, you, you came from a, you know, a a corporate role, like, you know, working in in the industry as well. And uh, we're going to cover, you know, just the broad kind of conversation today around, you know, why is money not taught in schools? What's your experiences from childhood as well? And, uh, you know, some of those learnings now, how you're passing that on with your own children to teach them and become better equipped as they become young adults as well. So let's start with your family, Susie. Tell us a bit more about the members of your family. So there's myself and my husband, Ben. And we have two boys. So we've got Digby, who is nine, I think then he's almost 10, and Felix, who um, is eight. So they're starting to get to the age where they definitely need to start learning about money and how to deal with it and kind of, you know, trying to start them nice and early. Yeah. And and, and what is what are their interests right now, Susie? <laughs> Pokemon, uh, football um they do they do love they do love music actually they play quite a lot of music at school they um my my elder son plays a double bass uh the younger one plays the piano um they like musical theater as well actually the older one um but yeah usual boy stuff kind of cricket football rugby pokemon yeah. you know stuff like that yeah and and obviously they see you working and they see probably some of your profile online videos they understand i imagine what it is that you're doing day to day and you know how 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 those conversations around business uh beginning to evolve uh, you know are they becoming curious as to what you do and you know in fact you work for yourself and you're not working for somebody else yeah it's really interesting so one thing i feel really passionate about is that i think that the whole job market um, the whole environment of corporate jobs, job market, I think is is changing now. And by the time they get out into the world of work is going to be so significantly different than it is today. I don't think we can even comprehend how different it's going to be, you know, with the advent of AI um, and, you know, all the kind of structural and global changes that are happening um, in the workplace. And um, so one thing that I'm really, really keen so in cylinder, but we talk about a lot is, you know, um, the benefits of being an entrepreneur, um, how you can, um, yeah. So, so I've, I've taught them like my eldest son, even now he can quote it ad lib, 
what about you know how do you find a product to sell to the market well you need to find where you're going to add the most value to the most people you know and that can affect your pricing and all that kind of stuff so I'm trying to kind of instill it instill in them that that kind of stuff and it's really interesting because already my eldest son like we need to be starting to choose schools for him like secondary schools and you go to these open days and, you know, the ones that turn me right off are the ones that say, oh, yes, well, we, we want them to get the best job or, you know, for the job market or whatever. And I just think I just find it so frustratingly naive that these schools are still on the old modus operandi of which you're going to churn you out. You're going to go into higher education. Then you're going to go into a corporate job or whatever. Um, and, you know, I just think that that's fine you know what one of my sons could quite possibly be an engineer or something like that actually that's kind of you know that that's I can see that already that's kind of his skill set and if he wants to do that then absolutely higher education and that route is absolutely the right thing to go down but equally um I think that the, the education system needs to be starting to kind of really um change its change its attitude towards how it's dealing with children and how it's educating them because it's just not equipped for where I think that we're going to over the next kind of 10 to 20 years. Yeah. And that's, a, a, I guess, a, you know, a, a conversation that's been taking place for a long time, right? Why are schools not, you know, starting to evolve? And and, and why do you think that is, Susie? Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm not an educationist, so I don't know the actual reason. But I suspect that, um, I suspect schools are the last things to catch up with where the world is. Um, you know, if you think about the way that our schooling system is structured, it's actually structured for, for Victorian industry. You know, everybody's sitting in a classroom looking at a blackboard or a whiteboard these days and learning things, you know, that like that is, that is, that was absolutely well equipped uh, at the end of the 19th century for, you know, people being churned out into kind of the industrial um, economy we had then. It's absolutely not, um, it's absolutely not kind of the right way. You know, what my elder son is actually dyslexic. Um, and, the, and the way he learns is by doing and feeling and, you know, interacting with his learning. And actually the school he goes to does do that a lot. But I can see as they move up the education system, that just gets less and less. You know, they do loads of that in nursery. And as they go through the school, it just it gets less and less. And I, I just think that, my perception, and I don't know whether this is right or not, my perception is just that, um, A, the government has got all these tests and exams and teachers, you know, I sympathise greatly because they have all these, you know, tick boxes to, to achieve. Um, and being innovative in the education system, there's just no room for it at the moment. And so, you know, how, how can they break out of that if, you know, the school is seen as failing by inspectors, if they don't achieve all the tick boxes it just feels like it's totally broken in terms of the system mm. and, and that's the question we've been asking really Susie is if your children aren't learning about finance at school then where are they learning about it and of course could be social media hopefully it's at home so let's hear about perhaps some of the things that you've been doing with them and and also as they've grown up right because the lessons and the conversations when they're young you know four or five years old to where they are now are going to be very different. So can you remember when perhaps, you know, the first interaction with money was for them? Oh, I genuinely blocked out the early years. (laughs) (laughs) um, Yeah, I mean, um, it's interesting because um, I I think, you know, being being self-critical probably could have done a lot more. In, in the earlier in their earlier years, um, I know their grandparents have always done a lot. They've always given them a little purse with some pound coins in. They've taken them to car boot sales, and you know they've they've been able to um, they've been able to spend with their own money. We do that now with them as well. You know they have their own money, and then when it's gone, it's gone. And um, but yeah, I think I think in terms of like early earlier, yeah, kind of taught. We've talked a lot. Tried not to spoil them, so tried not to. I want that. Okay, we'll buy it for you. Like they definitely tried not to be that type of parent, um, and also kind of tried to show them the properties we invest in and the work we do, so that they understand kind of where the money comes from. So just kind of gently holding their hand on the journey, really, kind of way back when when they were when they were smaller. 
Mm. And and how 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 did you or do you approach pocket money? Because you know people have differing views of whether you know there's some sort of exchange. You talked about understanding value now, right? So you know just giving money is there was there any kind of exchange or you know uh, uh, a method of understanding that perhaps you need to save or you need to divide that money up for for different things? Yeah, so so that is one that I've really grappled with, and. Um... I'm not convinced that pocket money is the right is the right answer to it. Um, and yeah, so so I mean, an example is we went to uh, you know they get the birthday money or Christmas money, and they and they are very good at kind of not just. But I mean, I if they want to spend it on rubbish, like I don't let them. I'm like you know, and then we talk about investing and how you can earn interest, and I'll give you an example of that in a minute, but. Um, we went out shopping on Saturday, we went to get some school shoes, which I bought, but then we went to another shop and they were like, oh, I really want that Pokemon t-shirt. And I was like, well, if you want it enough, you, you can buy it for yourself. Oh no, I'm not wasting my money on that. I was like, well, you can't want it enough then, so that's fine. I'm not buying it for you. Anyway, Kate came to the, you know, they actually bought it themselves. And it's really interesting to see that, um, how much they love that t-shirt because they bought it you know like it, it's a completely different value that they've put on it you know it, it's not just oh mum's just bought it and therefore it's it's easy um so uh, actually what we're just starting to introduce and, and we're not there yet like it's it's a it's a bit of a bit of a task is there's a book um called the entitlement trap i forget who the author is and it's something that really resonated with me as a system of teaching your children about money, the value of money. It, it's also got a load of other stuff about values and family interaction and, you know, closest as a family. I, I would recommend a lot, anybody to read it, actually. Um, I think it's one of those where you could do everything or you could just pick little bits out of it. But basically what um, what they recommend is having like a family bank and that actually... Um, you don't buy your children anything. So school uniforms, school shoes, treats, um, anything. Um, obviously food for the house, et cetera, is, is excluded, but anything that is theirs, they have to get out of the family bank and therefore the value they will then put on that because you know it's not just being given to them is significant. So that's just something that the kind of back half of this year we're we're starting to introduce so I'll let you know how that goes in due course yeah no that sounds like an interesting <laughs> interesting trial for sure and you talked about um you, you com commented there about you know interest and uh, I know you've just recently come back from a, a a nice family holiday um so uh there was some you know some interesting things that you were doing over there as well to help them learn a bit more about that yeah, I wish I could say that this was completely intentional. I totally planned it, but it was one of those opportunities you get as a parent and you like being aware of what you want to teach your children, you kind of jump on it. So I think awareness is a really big thing as a parent, you know, to try and use little moments to actually teach your children big life lessons, actually. And this is a really good example. So, yeah, we were very lucky enough to go to Thailand for a few weeks at the beginning of the summer. Um and we had a lovely family holiday, but before we went, uh, the boys' grandparents gave them a little wallet with some Thai baht, the current currency. Um, so I think it was 700 baht each, um, which I think, gosh, I forget now, it feels like a lifetime ago, but I think it's about 20, 20 between 20 and 25 pounds. And, and that was going to be their spending money for the holiday. So we got over there day one. We got into a taxi uh, from our hotel to go to one of the one of the palaces or temples or something that we were going to, and obviously we were like sitting in the taxi and all the craziness going on around us. And um, I could see that the taxi meter was like in the hundreds, and I only had like a thousand plus. And I and so I said to one of the boys, "Oh, can I um, can I borrow um?" some of your hundreds, because they had hundreds in their wallets. Can I, can I borrow your, one of your hundreds? And they were like, well, mummy, are you going to pay interest on it? <laughs> you know, I was like, oh, okay, I think I might have taught you too well here. Um, so I said, okay, I'll do a deal with you. Um, how about if, I, if we borrow money from you on this holiday, 
I'll pay you 10% interest. Now, I know that's extortionate level of interest. It was partly because I was, I was on a holiday and I didn't want to have to calculate any lower percentages <laughs> on it. Um, how about I'll, I'll pay you 10% daily on what we, what we borrow? I also knew they didn't have thousands of thousands as well, which would have been, been a little crippling for the holiday. Um, anyway, so what the way that kind of unraveled was that they were so desperate to lend us the money. And I'd already talked to them previously about, you know, you don't you don't just necessarily have money and then go and spend it. What you're best to do is you're best to keep the capital, invest it and spend the interest. That That's kind of the way it should work. And, you know, to a lesser or greater degree. And so anyway, it turned out that I would basically borrowed all their, or my husband and I, we borrowed all their money. <laughs> um, and they actually came back. But by, by the end of the holiday, they actually came back with more than they actually took with them. Significantly more, actually. I mean, it w- wasn't going to break our bank. But um Unfortunately, I wish I wish to wish I could say that they've come home, you know, they've saved it all up or whatever. But actually what happened, they went to a market at the end and there was a load of football strips and they really they wanted to to spend their money on that. But actually each of them got one one more football strip out of it than they would have done otherwise. Mm-hmm. And it was like a really nice reward for them. And so it was really interesting, you know, like, and, and it was almost like there was, oh, don't, I said, oh, I can pay you back now. And I don't pay us back. It's fine. You know, we're happy to kind of learn the interest, to, to, to earn the interest. And it was actually, it was really accidental, but it was really, it was really great. And it was really pleasing. And I know that that's a big life lesson they've learned. And so we're trying to carry that on now in terms of, you know, so my husband informed me, the, uh, sorry, my eldest son informed me the other day that I owed him 50 pounds. And I was like, how did that happen? Because I borrowed 30 from you. I don't know, maybe to pay some the cleaner or something. And uh, and uh, and he was like, oh, no, well, if I calculate interest daily at this, then I was like, okay, this could really get us into trouble. But actually, you know, it's a, it's a really nice lesson. So it's just like a really simple thing that you could do on holiday, but actually works work really nicely. Yeah, and I, I'm sure that lesson will stick with them for sure. And and, and it's the experience, isn't it? As you say, it's uh, it's making it fun, making it memorable. Just sitting down at a table and, and sort of drawing and writing some stuff on a piece of paper probably wouldn't have had that same impact, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And and it's nice just to drop things in conversation as well. You know, if you start talking about money or mindset or anything like that, just dropping things in, you know, not going, not baggy on about it and bore, boring them, but just kind of, yeah, just making it interesting. Yeah. And if you reflect, oh, sorry, if you reflect back on your own childhood, Susie, um, you know, can you, can you remember a financial role model perhaps in your life? You know, was there, was there discussions around money that you had with your own parents or siblings? Well, this, this is a really interesting one. And I suspect, I suspect, I mean, it, a, my parents were completely unintentional in terms of teaching me about money. I didn't get any money lessons at all. Um, I was an only child, and I would say that to a lesser or greater degree, you know, I I, I wasn't a, I, I don't like to think I was a spoiled brat, but I don't think I would I wanted for anything, you know. And if I wanted a new bike, they wouldn't give it to me straight away, but I would probably get it for a Christmas or a birthday present. So I was very very fortunate and very lucky. Um, I do remember when I was, um, I'd left university, or no, sorry, it was my my first or second year at university, and I wanted to go away on a a travelling with some friends, and my parents said, well, you better go out and get a job then. So I actually worked on a farm in the day, pulling leeks and cabbages and stuff, and then in the evening, I literally come and scrub my filthy fingernails, and then I'd rush out and be a waitress in in a local pub. And I did that for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I got together the money for the holiday. And then my parents said, you know what? We will actually buy it for you, but you've learned a really great lesson here. And that, you know, you've learned. And I, that, I definitely think that lesson did set me up for, um, for, for you know, for, for realizing that the kind of you get the reward at the end of it and you have to put mm-hmm. the effort in. But I think I've always kind of, since, since I've learned about money blueprints and, you know, the effect of role models in your life, um, almost unknowingly giving you a money blueprint and how actually it can take a long time to lose your money blueprint. I I have actually reflected quite a lot on where my money blueprints come from. And I've, I've realized I'm a really messed up mix between my two of my, my parents. So my dad, um, who thankfully is still alive, he, he, um, he would quite happily shove everything on credit card and quite happily... Um, 
you know, but but believed in living for today. And, you know, if you ask him now, God, yeah, he's had some money worries over the years, but actually he doesn't regret a second of it because he's lived a really full life and he's had a fantastic time. And then my mum had a very, very um, poor and frugal background. And, and so she just resented spending money at all. And so like she was, you know, every time my dad wanted to spend something, they'd have a row because she didn't want to spend it. And so I've got this really crazy mix still in my head where, and the thing is awareness is part of it, right? So you, when you're self-aware, you can recognize it and see when it's kicking in, which is really, really important. But I've got this, you know, I've, I've, I'm not as crazy as my dad in terms of spending, but I also do believe in, you know, kind of experiences and, and, you know, uh, being in the present, et cetera. Um, but, but I've also got this, this voice in my head that, you know, wants to go to shop at, shop at budget shops and get everything for the cheapest price possible. And so, so it is a little bit screwed up, I have to say. And um, I've definitely learned to, or tried, I don't think I'm there yet, tried to develop my own blueprint over the years through self-awareness. But yeah, this, that kind of stuff takes a long time to unpick. Um, and if you if you kind of haven't read, yeah, you know, I really like Secrets of a Millionaire Mind by T. Harbecker. Um, that that was the first book that really kind of hit home to me like, that actually we have these blueprints that, um, that that are kind of almost subconsciously given to us that we uh, that, that we kind of adopt in our lives. And if you don't clock it, then it can actually be really harmful. Absolutely true. And 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 are you have you been conscious of that as uh, you know as your children have been growing up to make sure that you know you're not almost reliving that same past you know with with you and your husband. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And we 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 don't talk about money money in front of them. You know, like we don't like say, oh, you know, I've got enough money for this or whatever. You know, like we just don't we just don't do that. And I think that language with children in all aspects, not just with money and finances, but in everything is really, really important. And I think that sloppy language with children can be actually really harmful, you know? So a, a non-money example is, you know, um, oh, you're being, oh, don't be so stupid. You know, you're being really stupid. Um, you can say that when you're frustrated, but actually, you know, in this moment, you're not behaving in a very sensible way, you know? So it's not your identity. You are not a stupid person. In this moment, your behavior is, 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 you know, and I think that um, I'm really conscious of kind of instilling that from a money perspective as well. Just, you know, so um, just because I'm aware of my blood money blueprint or, or kind of the blueprint I had instilled in me, then I think uh, I, I'm very, we're very, very careful in terms of our language around our children. Because I think that it's so easy just to slip into sloppy language and then, and, and then, you know, they just remember it. Mm. Yeah. And you talked earlier about their their passions, things that they enjoy doing now, obviously, as as children. And are they seeing or starting to understand that they could potentially turn some of their passions into profit? You know, you, future YouTubers, things like this that actually could generate income streams for them? I would say no, not at the moment. And partly because we are slightly Victorian parents that we don't let them go on social media or anything. So um, I think there's plenty of time for that personally. Um, I kind of want them to have a proper wholesome, we live in the country, I want them to have a proper wholesome childhood. Um, but equally, I kind of recognise that we can't hide them from it forever. So to, so the challenge, I think the challenge for modern day parents is introducing that kind of stuff, but in a really healthy way that doesn't become doesn't expose them to, to the toxic side of social media and uh, the exploitative side of social media as well. And, and I think I don't think there's a blueprint for that. I think that is really challenging, personally. Um, I would absolutely love them to be selling lemonade at the end of our drive, etc. Like like you hear a lot of kids, you know, entrepreneurial kids started off, but we live in the middle of nowhere, so I don't think they do any sales whatsoever. Bless them. So I think they might have to need to think of something else to do. Yeah. And uh, as you said at the beginning, you know, changing times, who knows where things will be in the next 10, 20, 30 years. And we know that, you know, young adults today will be living a lot longer. Right. So things like pensions, things like job security, we need to have a different plan. And uh, hence why we're you know, trying to get the message out there. And thank you for sharing your insights with us today, Susie, on uh, on what you're doing with your own family. Oh, it's a pleasure. And I think what you're doing is fantastic. Like genuinely, I think this needs to be talked about more because um, 
I think that, you know, if it, if it's not, then as you say, the education system isn't going to fix it. So, yeah, I think I think what you and Kevin are doing is fantastic. Oh, thank you, Susie. Great to have you today and uh, we'll catch you up again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. I really enjoyed listening about that trip to Thailand, Kevin. Very, uh, very good lessons there. We'll get into that in a bit more detail in just a moment. Before we do that, let's read out one of our recent reviews on Trustpilot. And following on from last week's event in Manchester, John has kindly taken time to put a few words down, actually. So uh, let me get into this one. Firstly, let me congratulate yourself, Christian and the team on a well-organized and very productive Wealth Builders event in Manchester last night. I wasn't certain what to expect, but I am so glad that I attended and I look forward to future events and I feel re-energized and thrilled to have met new connections. The passion to improve one's life, one's family and do good for the world was palpable from everyone who attended and I felt privileged to be in such a dynamic, progressive an entrepreneurial company. Wishing you and the team much success and happiness. Regards, and thank you for being there in person, both Kevin and Christian. It really does make a difference when the head honchos are willing to turn up to their own events and engage with their clients and supporters. And as a final word, may I also say it was a lovely touch and appreciated that nibbles and drinks were provided, both of which were high quality. <laughs> a head honcho, eh? <laughs> So the tapas was really good. Uh, Pep Guardiola's restaurant, actually. And um, it was really good. I particularly liked those um, um, Iberian ham croquetas. I thought they were outstanding. No, but it was a lovely event. It was good to see people that we don't normally get to see because of uh, ge you know geographical limitations. So that was great. And we've got plans for Birmingham Sterling, I think, which is... Uh, you know, one of the Scottish ones. I think somebody wants us to go to Aberdeen, but it's just a little bit too far for now. But we'll get to all parts of the country. The Northeast as well is something that's on the cards for early next year. So wherever there's an opportunity and if someone's got a great venue that they can suggest or even perhaps they they own or have a connection to, then we'd uh, love to know more because the greater the opportunity it is for us to get and meet people, then the more that community will grow, particularly around the families, uh, bringing it back to the podcast, Chris, that the family opportunity is all about, you know, taking those magical moments, I think Susie refers to almost, where you can, you can give a lesson on the fly. You can just find an opportunity, in her case, in a cab, uh, but anywhere where you can dispense a little money lesson. Not that every lesson should be about money, absolutely not, but where those lessons present themselves to take advantage of that. And I think she did that really well. In fact, all too well, looking at the compound interest rate those children were calculating on a daily basis, which is probably a bit of good for mental maths as well, I think. Yeah, no, I like that. And, and it clearly shows, doesn't it, that creating an experience, making the lesson fun, it remains much longer and much stronger than uh, than otherwise. So uh, that's a key part of the the family's program, isn't it? It's about participation. It's about you know understanding how our members are, are doing these kind of fun things to instill these lessons. And and I think that was a brilliant one that Susie shared there. Yeah, and the other thing that's interesting for me is I hear how other families deal with this sort of overall subject of money and instilling responsibility is the difference of opinion you get. Uh, so while Susie wasn't a big fan of pocket money, and I get that, others are absolute fans of pocket money, but what she was a fan of was the tactile experience of touching money. And I think the grandparents brought something to bear there. And I love the, just the sound of the fact that they had, you know, maybe an envelope with, with the Taiwanese Bart or a little purses they had with with money in from time to time i think it's always good to to give uh, children when it comes to money almost an experience of the tactile nature of money we've talked very often about money's all about tap 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 or um swipe 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 and, and less about real touching of that and in fact even uh, king charles has done something about that he's introduced a whole set of coins now to deliberately design to encourage the tactile nature of those coins for children to touch them. So, so I think lots of ways that children could touch money, whether it's 
giving them pocket money and little pay packets that they have to open or little envelopes or little purses, something for the younger ones where they, they get that experience. So I think anything that brings a bit of fun to it uh, is a great thing. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. A way of valuing money when, when you actually spend it yourself and you've, you've earned it, you've done something to generate that rather than just be given it. And we see that actually go through into later life, don't we as well, Kevin, you know, when it comes to, to education and if our members value the importance of, continued learning and development and sometimes that involves courses and products and books and uh, often you see when something is given for free someone doesn't value it they don't take advantage of it and you know as opposed to when you've invested in something for yourself and I think that was one of the lessons that Susie said there you know her children are actually spending that money on things they want they really value those things much more. Absolutely I think it's a great thing I've even seen recently uh, someone who was promoting a course and it was really good content, but rather than do it for nothing, they did it for a pound, which is a charitable contribution of a pound. And I thought that was very clever because it, it means you've done something. So you've appreciated that even if you've spent a pound on something, you know, you're much more likely to to turn up. And if in that particular case, if you didn't turn up, then there was a larger sum of money to uh, to contribute because of the fact that food and drinks were given. So lots of reasons that people should pay to participate in things uh, because you see more value when you do mm. so Susie spoke about being an only child like myself and her parents being very different in uh, in their money habits as she was growing up her father was a spender her mum was a saver and Susie referred to this money blueprint that of course is I guess embedded when you're a child and uh, the surroundings impact you and that can take a while in later life to to almost rewire and change and, and that's something of course if you then have children you need to be mindful of that you don't kind of slip back into those old habits but where are you going to get the blueprint from you know you you, you can only really get it historically because of the lack of social media you're only going to get it from from parents but now increasingly with social media and she talked about that how to do so in a much more helpful way rather than a harmful way I think now as parents, there are more influences in our children. Uh, and then our younger people just need a little bit more help with that, which which ups the ante for us as parents and grandparents to be much more aware of the, the damaging things that can go on, not just in our own blueprint and our own language and how we convey information, but what information they're getting out with our radar. You know, what are they seeing on social media? What are they seeing by way of comparison? And how can we influence that in a positive way? That's right. And um, our family's program is currently closed. Our initial launch a few weeks back, we've just closed the doors and we're working with our initial cohort. But of course, if you would like to be on the wait list for when we open the doors again, then we would love for you to do so. So head to wealthbuilders.co.uk forward slash families and just pop your name and email in there and we'll keep you updated. We'll send you information so that you can see a little bit inside the program currently and understand what we're doing with our members and some of the guests that we've had on the podcast over recent weeks, Will Rainey and uh, Susie, they'll all be doing live sessions as well to go into more detail around these topics. Mm, yeah, looking forward to that. And um, I'm so pleased we've got a cohort to work with because that means we're getting a chance to to meet and discuss with them online all together. Uh, and that's helpful, particularly when you're knocking the kinks out of things, shaping things, just getting things better. So they were afforded a, a pretty no-brainer price. And, and of course, as we get better, that price will go up, but we're always determined to keep it so affordable uh, and by the way, you know, just so thrilling to see that a couple of people who were members who forgot that they got the ability to be able to access the family's content for free, decided to give that as a gift to other people. And I think uh, just noteworthy to say that, I think Chris Stanley was one of those, um, just brilliant that... Uh, our members are thinking about the generosity for other families as well. Yeah. 
Great. So we hope you enjoyed listening to today's episode. And if you want to get in touch with us about anything to do with either today's uh, conversation or just to find out a bit more about how we may be able to help you to build your wealth for you and your family, do drop us an email, hello at wealthbuilders.co.uk. We would love to hear from you. And finally, if you enjoyed today, then why not share this podcast with a friend? and uh, hit the share button on your podcasting app and uh, send them a little gift. And uh, we would appreciate that very much. Mm, Joel, you just talked about gifts. So that's always nice when somebody takes a little bit of time out. We put a lot of time and energy into this and hopefully that's appreciated. So from time to time, if you hear something that's good, either share it or just tell us you like it. Mm -hmm. Okay, Kevin, we will be here same time, same place next week. Until then, my friend. See ya.